Furman to please uh, introduce a grand grand speaker for today. Thank you, Margaret. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Um, so thank you all for joining us today for Cardiovascular Medicine Grand Rounds. I have the distinct pleasure of introducing Dr. Monique Hinchcliffe, who will be speaking on the heart and systemic sclerosis. Dr. Hinchcliffe earned her undergraduate degree from Boston College, majoring in music, piano performance. She went on to earn her medical degree from the Chicago Medical School. She came back east to do her residency at Norwalk Hospital, and she returned to the Midwest to complete her rheumatology fellowship at Northwestern. She joined Northwestern as faculty, rising to the rank of associate professor, along the way obtaining her Master's of Science in Clinical Investigation from Northwestern. During her tenure at Northwestern, she served as the Associate Clinical Director and eventually the Co-Director of the Northwestern University Scleroderma Program and Director of the Translational Research for the Northwestern University Scleroderma Program. She was lured back east in 2018 to join the section of Rheumatology, Allergy, and Immunology, where she has led the development of the Scleroderma Program. Here at Yale, she has distinguished herself as a scholar and a researcher, as the Director of Clinical and Translational Research in the section of Rheumatology, Allergy, and Immunology. She's extremely well published in the field of scleroderma, and I've had the pleasure of working with her as we develop our Cardio Room program. It's my honor and pleasure um, to introduce her to us today, and many thanks, Monique, for speaking to us. Thank you, Margaret, for that nice introduction. And thank you to Ed Miller for inviting me to speak. So I asked Ed what I should talk about. And he said, well, I think you should talk about the heart. But as you can imagine, that's kind of an intimidating topic for a rheumatologist to be speaking to a room full of cardiologists about the heart. So bear with me. Please feel, to, uh, feel free to interrupt me or um, correct me if I say something wrong or just if you wish to uh, enlighten the group. If I miss anything, please don't, don't hesitate to interrupt. Um, just a second to advance here. Okay, so here I have a few disclosures. Here are the learning objectives. Um, it's, it's cardiovascular disease is highly pre prevalent in patients with systemic sclerosis. We've done some novel work, I think, in, in using echocardiographic data to try to identify relative, clinically rele relevant groups of patients. And then since my arrival at Yale, I've been working with the um, cardiology imaging folks to develop um, some novel techniques to quantify microvascular disease in the heart and the hands of SSC patients. So here's our scleroderma program. You'll recognize um, some of your colleagues that have graciously agreed to be the cardiologists for the program. So this was the first thing I did when I arrived in Yale at, in 2018 was to really get the clinical enterprise up and running. There were, there were scleroderma doctors who were seeing patients uh, before I came, but they just lacked a, a head. So that was, that was the service that I provided. Um, so we've been working really hard for the last two years to, to establish a world-class program. Um, so we have the team of ex experts established. Currently, we have a, more than 130 patients who fulfill specific 2013 American College of Rheumatology for systemic sclerosis. So that's a pretty large group for um, a rare disease. And last year, I was very proud that we were named a scleroderma center of excellence by the tri-state chapter of the Scleroderma Foundation. So as Margaret mentioned, we have started a uh, cardiology rheumatology combined clinic. We have our inaugural um, uh, clinic day uh, coming up on Tuesday, November 24th. And so if you have a patient with a rheumatic disease, um, we incur we're trying to focus those patients into one clinic, um, both for um, to provide focused patient care as well as to train fellows. And Attila Fair is going to be joining Dr. Furman in that in that clinic. I'd like to start off by just thanking all the wonderful people who've been so good to me since I arrived um, at uh, Yale. Uh, all the folks in cardiology have just been really great to work with and and very welcoming. I won't list. I won't name all of them. But they're all listed here. And if I forget anybody, I certainly apologize. 
So this is the overview. I'm just going to present a brief case. Part one looks very long and, and boring to all of you, but I assure you I'm going to go through it quickly. I just want to give us all a background of the disease and then we'll, we'll spend the majority of the hour focused on research. So this was a woman that I cared for while I was in Chicago. She was 18 when she noticed that her uh, class ring, for her, her high school class ring no longer fit. It was, her hands had become puffy. And within a very uh, fast, um, very quick time period, she developed the worst skin fibrosis I've ever seen. Um, so there on the left, she's attempting to make a fist and you can see on the right, she's attempting to straighten her fingers and there's very little movement. We referred her for a lymphoblative autologous stem cell transplant at Northwestern. We had an active um, stem cell transplant program there and she did well eventually. Uh, she did well initially, but eventually within five years, her disease returned and she ultimately passed away from, from the disease. So it's a very severe, can be a very severe disease. So just some epidemiology, it's, it's a rare disease, thankfully, it occurs sporadically worldwide. There are clusters, there's a cluster in Oklahoma and a group of Native Americans. Um, the disease does occur in families. It's more commonly that autoimmune diseases cluster in families, not necessarily systemic sclerosis specifically, but um, we do definitely see a familial uh, predilection for autoimmune diseases. Um, there's the incidence and the prevalence. So basically we're seeing in the United States about 6,000 new cases per year, and we're trying to attract a greater number of those new patients to come to see us at Yale. It's a disease that prefer preferentially um, targets women greater than men, but men typically have a worse disease course and are more likely to die of the disease. And it uh, hits people in the, in the middle ages, young to middle ages. So on the right, you can see the, the hands of a patient with um, systemic sclerosis. So you can see the tight, shiny skin, no hair on the hands because of the tight skin. Um, and then the, the lower image shows a patient with um, the characteristic facies of scleroderma with the small lips and the protuberant teeth. Um, so that's a, a classic finding. So SSE has the highest case fatality rate of all the uh, autoimmune rheumatic diseases. One in four patients with the diffuse form of the disease dies within eight years of diagnosis. And it, it causes uh, 11 to 22 years of, of life lost compared to healthy controls. The uh, pathobiology is tripartite. We don't understand it well. Definitely patients have autonuclear antibody formation. And I show the immunofixation patterns on the top there. Um, they develop vasculopathy, and that's usually the first sign of the disease. So patients, 95% of patients with systemic sclerosis will develop Raynaud phenomena. You can see the picture here. Um, and there's a difference between the primary form of, of Raynaud, which many of us suffer from, um, that does not cause nail fold capillary changes. So this is what the nail fold capillaries would look like in a patient with primary Raynaud. But patients with systemic sclerosis or other autoimmune diseases um, develop a, a worse Raynaud phenotype, and they do have um, abnormal uh, vasculature, which you can see here on this video, nail fold capillaroscopy. Um, and then the, care, the clinical characteristic of the disease is fibrosis. So skin fibrosis, patients of color lose pigment, which is very distressful for them. Um, so they have what's called salt and pepper appearance of their skin, where areas are darker and areas are lighter. Again, you see the protuberant teeth, the small lips, and then the leading cause of death is um, interstitial lung disease, um, as you can see on this axial cut of a high-res CT. Fortunately, the first FDA-approved drug for systemic sclerosis was approved last year, an entetinib or OFEV, and that has, um, can at least halt the progression of interstitial lung disease, although it's certainly a modest um, improvement in force vital capacity. So this is not meant to bore you, um, just to know that we pinch the skin on patients in 17 different body areas and score them from zero to three. And then the reason we do that is because it allows us to classify patients into clinically relevant subsets. So there's three subsets, um, two predominant ones, the limited cutaneous systemic sclerosis form, and that's the majority of patients. Then there's a very rare um, systemic sclerosis sine scleroderma. So these patients have all the internal organ manifestations potentially, but none of the skin findings. So that's a di more difficult diagnosis to make. And then there's a, a secondary type, this diffuse cutaneous systemic sclerosis. And as the name implies, they have more skin fibrosis or areas of skin fibrosis, as, as you can see in the gold. Um, the gold indicates the areas of the body that can become fibrotic. Uh, 
So the major differences I wanted to highlight, um, one of the major differences between patients with limited or sine scleroderma and diffuse is, is the involvement of the heart. So typically patients with the limited um, skin disease don't and develop a lot of um, severe heart disease, whereas diffuse patients tend to have more heart involvement that can be severe and can be a, can be a cause of death. So here's just a few of the um, clinical manifestations. Um, so we, we talked about the, the Raynaud phenomena. Um, patients, as you know, can develop pulmonary arterial hypertension with right ventricular enlargement. This was a patient who was recently hospitalized at Yale who just suffered a severe digital ulcer from uh, Raynaud phenomena. And this is a patient that I saw in Chicago um, who had really extensive telangiectasias on the face. Um, we talked about the sclerodactyly, which is the cardinal feature, the, the tight skin on the fingers. And I like to step back and you can see kind of the, shi the tiny or the shiny um, skin from a distance. That's the best way to visualize it. There's a potential for esophageal dysfunction. So this is a um, pH manometry and you can see the, the swallow is initiated up here. The skeletal muscle is intact so the patients are able to swallow okay. Um, this is a healthy patient, so uh, you can see the propagation of the swallow down into the past the lower esophageal sphincter. And this is a patient with scleroderma where they initiate the swallow okay, but then there's the lack of the um, motility of the esophagus. Um, we talked about the potential for interstitial lung disease, and you can see the histology here with all the pink indicating the expansion of the extracellular matrix. Um, their uh, patients with the diffuse form of the disease are more likely to develop scleroderma renal crisis, which is a medical emergency, which uh, is evident by extremely high blood pressure and um, rapid onset of renal failure if not treated aggressively. And then there's what's uh, near and dear to, your, to all of your hearts, the potential for subendocardial fibrosis and diastolic dysfunction that, that can commonly occur in patients. So I provide uh, this slide just to give you a sense of the timing. So the, as we mentioned, Reno starts very early and then after uh, several years after the diagnosis of the first non reno symptom, this is when the trouble starts to, to pick up in some patients. So um, they can get uh, musculoskeletal issues, um, skeletal involvement uh, with myopathy and weakness, um, diffuse interstitial lung disease, and then this myocardial involvement here that can occur, you know, early, relatively early in the in the disease course. And again, it preferentially targets the patients with the diffuse cutaneous subtype of the disease. So I provided this slide just to show that patients with systemic sclerosis typically die of systemic sclerosis, a systemic sclerosis related complication. So here was a group um, in the United States out in Colorado, and they um, determined the underlying cause of death as well as uh, 20, potentially 20 additional multiple causes of death, and they reviewed these carefully. So um, patients who had died of interstitial lung disease, for instance, that was attributable to SSC were counted as an SSC death. So this was a nicely done study. And then uh, what are the causes of death? So the best data to, um, to identify the causes of death was a, a paper published in 2000 by the Europeans. And um, they have a beautiful registry of scleroderma patients called um, USTAR. Um, it's a European League Against Rheumatism database. And they sent out a structured survey to, to rheumatologists to determine the cause of death. And you'll see here that um, after pulmonary causes, um, myocardial involvement was the next, was the second leading cause of death um, and mostly attributable to heart failure and arrhythmias. So, so I really do need, need your help in caring for these patients with systemic sclerosis along with um, my lung colleagues because it's impossible for one physician to be able to tackle all these problems at once. So that was the quick summary of systemic sclerosis. Um, it's rare, it has high morbidity, high mortality, has worst um, case-related fatality for all the autoimmune uh, diseases. There's those two main subsets identified by the extent and the pattern of skin fibrosis, the limited form and the diffuse form. You all will be probably seeing more of the diffuse patients um, if you're helping me care for, for the scleroderma patients. And again, cardiovascular disease is the second leading cause of SSC-related deaths. So part two, we're gonna focus on, um, on research. 
Um, so at, at first I'll present some data that we generated um, in Chicago that uh, used echocardiographic data to identify potentially clinically meaningful groups in, in the scleroderma patient population. Um, then I'm going to discuss and um, present some of the elegant work that Attila Ferrer has done um, in collaboration with myself and, and Ed Miller and um, Dr. Sinousis and Dr. Papa Dimitris. Um, so we are interested in uh, determining whether when we treat Raynaud phenomena, I'm interested in, in knowing if, if I treat Raynaud phenomena aggressively, um, will that have an impact on the development of cardiac microvascular disease development over time? And I think that question is unknown and, and an important one because patients often ask if they need to continue taking twice daily medications um, throughout the year uh, when really their reno is most active in the winter time. And so that's, that's a common question that I'm asked and I really don't have a good answer. Um, We'll review uh, the utility, the potential utility of performing Rubidium 82 uh, PET CT in patients for quantifying heart and hand microvascular disease. So it's well established that it's a good method for quantifying heart disease, but um, hand disease is an unanswered question. And then, uh, if time permits, we'll I'll show you some data that we generated um, with T1 mapping um, using cardiac MRI in SSC patients. So here is this, this concept of SSC echo groups. So SSC um, can, uh, or cardiac involvement can occur in SSC patients due to, to at least four main, main categories that I can think of. Um, one is due obviously to the underlying SSC disease. So there's the potential for microvascular ischemia that can lead to myocardial fibrosis potential for diastolic dysfunction. So that's intrinsic to SSC. Then there could be a secondary consequence of SSC. So you can, we mentioned that patients can develop um, scleroderma renal crisis or can develop um, just proteinuria from having, from having scleroderma. And those patients obviously could be at increased risk for developing uh, heart failure or left ventricular hypertrophy. Then, of course, patients with systemic sclerosis can have other comorbidities, just as any of us could, like hypertension or diabetes, and so that can obviously affect the heart. And then some of the medications that we use to treat SSC, specifically cyclophosphamide, can cause an acute myocarditis, and we've had some bad experiences with that, um, where the drugs that we're using to, to make a patient uh, feel better have actually made them much worse. So there is an unmet need to develop a standardized method to reliably uh, identify SSC cardiac disease phenotypes, which we really don't understand, and try to, to gain a deeper understanding of the disease heterogeneity and the different pathogenesis of the different types of, of cardiac involvement. So I'm going to segue here into completely uh, something different, which is going to seem like a non sequitur, but so my work um, for my K, my K award was to, to perform skin biopsies from patients with systemic sclerosis. And we did um, skin biopsies of the clinically involved arm and the non-clinically involved back. And we compared the gene expression um, between those two sites using what at the time was extremely um, new and novel DNA microarray, and now it's rather passe. But, um, but at the time it was kind of state of the art. And so this was a study where um, there had been these intrinsic subsets uh, of, in SSC that had been identified. So we know that there's two or three clinically identifiable SSC subsets based upon the extent of skin fibrosis. And this, in this group, um, they published this paper, it, it was a Dartmouth group, and they published a paper, I believe in 2009, um, that introduce this concept of the intrinsic SSC subsets. And there were four of them, the fiber proliferative group, the inflammatory group, and a normal like group, and as, uh, also a limited group, which I didn't recapitulate here. But um, by comparing the arm and the back skin um, using average linkage hierarchical clustering, we were able to um, determine that patients who were treated with um, mycophenolate mofetil um, most often clustered, their baseline biopsies most often clustered within this inflammatory subset, which it makes sense because mycophenolate acts on lymphocyte proliferation. And so this, this was the hypothesis that, that I was testing, and it did seem, at least from this preliminary um, proof of concept paper, 
that patients that had an inflammatory gene expression signature in their skin um, belonged to this inflammatory subset. So as I was presenting, and we, um, we determined whether or not you were, so these were non-improvers that were in the fiber proliferative subset. The improvers, as I mentioned, were in the inflammatory subset. And um, we confirmed whether patients were an improver or a non-improver. You know, we tested my skin pinch test um, based on histology. And you can see here that the fibrosis score went down in the improvers and went up in the non-improvers. But um, that's just, that's kind of neither here nor there. The, the important point was that Sanjeev Shah, who was the cardiologist, one of the cardiologists for the Northwestern's Third Irma program, was in attendance at, at several of the research conferences where I was presenting these data. And he had, I think, really the novel um, idea to, to think about what would be other data, what would be other quantitative data besides the expression in skin. Um, could we use echocardiographic data and cluster that and, and identify patients, um, identify clinically relevant subsets of patients? And so his focus is primarily on heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, which is another disease from my discussions with him that's in need of better treatments and a better classification system, as it seems like all patients are just lumped into this, this group, heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, but, but they have different clinical outcomes and they have different presentations. And so there's a need to, to identify better um, methods for subsetting these patients. So, so he really, I think, that was a trailblazer in this regard and, and presented these data back in, in 2012 at the American Heart Association uh, where he used the echocardiographic data and clustered it, and ultimately published uh, those data in circulation in, in 2015. So, given his his success with that with that project, we thought, well, we could do certainly do the same thing with the echocardiographic data um, that we had been collecting for SSC patients since since both of us arrived at Northwestern. So, we Sanjeev and I met at the at a um, orientation for new faculty at Northwestern. We just happened to be seated next to each other and we got to talking and, and I said, oh, I get echocardiograms on all of my patients. Um, and he said, well, you should start sending them to me um, and we can have a, a research sonographer review them and quantify you know, very scientifically um, the parameters and we can start to do interesting research together. So that was just completely fortuitous. So. Um, so we, we applied his approach to the SSC echocardiograms. And the purpose, again, was to identify novel and clinically relevant SSC cardiac phenotypes in order to better understand the SSC cardiac pathophysiology. Um, we applied unsupervised statistical learning. And we can talk about all of the reasons why that may not be a good idea and how that can be uh, prone to error. But that's what we did. And our goal was really to identify these clusters as a means uh, and, and determine the association with mortality to validate our, our clusters. It, we, we were not trying to develop a mortality prediction rule, which several um, reviewers have suggested we do, and that's really not our interest. So we had 30, 340 patients that met criteria for SSC. We had detailed echocardiographic data that had been generated by one research echo sonographer and stored in a database. And we clustered those data to identify the echo pheno groups, compared them to survival and other clinical correlates as just a validation study. And then we um, uh, uh, you know, recruited a separate validation cohort. Now this was an, it was an independent validation cohort, but it was at Northwestern as well. So that's a potentially weakness of that study. So um, as I mentioned, we get echoes almost yearly in every patient with systemic sclerosis, standard measurements, as you all know. Um, but at the time, there were some additional quantitative measurements that weren't part of a standardized report, such as TAPSI and right ventricular fra fractional area change. And so that's why we involved a, a research echo sonographer. So this was the overview um, of the patients. There were 380 potential patients with an echo. There were some patients that had you know, insufficient clinical data or insufficient echo data, or they actually didn't have systemic sclerosis. They had a mimic such as morphia, or they had an overlap with other connective tissue disease. So we excluded them, but that left 340 patients with available echo data for analysis. So it was a pretty, pretty large group. 
so again, the echocardiograms uh, that we had those data, we had relevant clinical data that we got from the electronic heart, uh, electronic health record that we collected within three months of the initial clinic visit to cardiology. Um, there was the one research echo sonographer, and we uh, imputed missing data. So here was what we discovered. We discovered four groups. Um, you'll see here, so every row is an echocardiographic parameter. So it could be a binomial parameter, it could be a continuous parameter, but all of these are different echocardiographic features. And then every column is a patient. So these were the baseline echoes for all of our patients. And then we just, we used um, unsupervised clustering and identified these four groups of, of patients. So the first group um, were the oldest. Um, many, they had, uh, the majority were African-American. Um, they had diffuse SSC disease. They had the longest SSC disease duration, the highest BNP, the worst le left ventricular systolic function, the worst diastolic function, and they also had significant RV dysfunction. So this was a sick group of people. We had group three, their characteristics, they were characterized by also, um, they had a high percentage of males and African-Americans, more interstitial lung disease. So 80%, 88% of these patients had um, evidence of interstitial lung disease on their high-res CT of their lungs. They had higher pulse rates. Um, they had significant RV remodeling, relatively preserved left ventricular structure and function. They had high inflammatory markers, but they had the, the third best survival. Um, group two, these were mostly the limited patients, so they had low skin scores, they had long SC, SSC disease duration, mild RV and LV involvement, and they survived well, as did the first group, which was characterized by diffuse patients, but these patients had a high prevalence of RNA polymerase 3, and I didn't spend any time talking about that because Ed Miller told me you would not be interested in learning about serum autoantibodies, but this group, um, this, this group typically has a very um, severe skin fibrosis, it's very rapid and severe in the first one to three years after the disease starts, but then they, they spontaneously regress and their prognosis is actually really good. So it was, it was fitting that this group um, had diffuse disease, but had that were positive for the RNA polymerase three antibody. So I knew you'd want to see the actual data um, the, the actual echocardiographic data, but you can see here the group four, these were, this was the group with the worst survival. And you can see that they had, um, their, their parameters indicate that they have um, poor LV function and, and poor RV function as well. So, so basically these were the patients with the highest mortality, second highest mortality, um, and these two groups had pretty normal survival. So we did a um, Kaplan-Meier curve to, you know, time to event analysis, and you can see here group three and group four had the greatest uh, risk of death. Um, when we did um, Cox proportional hazards um, adjustments, we for age, race, sex, and lung involvement, um, the results were no longer statistically significant but there was a trend towards significance. So we think with um, potentially larger numbers of patients, we might be able to, to see some, some differences um, pan out between the survival in these groups. So we, we do think that these echo, echo phenol groups may be clinically relevant. So our, our work um, currently is to recruit external validation cohorts. So we have done that over the last several years. We have a group that we've, we've collected echo data for patients from Cornell, um, Utah, the University of Utah, the University of Pittsburgh. Um, we've continued to recruit patients at Northwestern. So we have uh, over 100 patients that, that weren't part of the discovery cohort that we can include in the validation cohort. And then I'm hopeful that we can recruit um, our patients at Yale. Um, we've been working really hard to collect all the echocardiograms that are done at outside hospitals on discs and have those loaded into the Yale system so that we can um, transfer those to Northwestern and have them analyzed by, by Lauren. So again, the future work, um, we know this is just the tip of the iceberg and, and by no means do I, uh, am I touting that these, that these groups are 
um, tried and true, this is just kind of the first shot across the bow with using echocardiographic data to identify clinically relevant um, groups of patients. Um, we do want to perform clustering separately for limited patients and diffuse patients because we really do feel that those disease entities are distinct from each other and it may not be appropriate to lump all the patients together. Uh, we're going to determine the association with various clinical outcomes for validation, not just survival. And as I mentioned, we have these this Yale cohort, and I'm going to be um, hitting, I think, Dr. Faridi up. Uh, it's been, Ed, Ed gave me his name as a potential um, collaborator who could help me um, get all these echo data and get them transferred successfully to Northwestern. So now uh, this Another uh, area of research that I'm interested in is um, renal phenomena and SSD cardiac disease, so understanding the interplay between these two um, manifestations of the disease. So I'm going to present some evidence to support cardiac renal phenomena. And I understand um, there, so these were early papers that were published. And when I read reviews from later, um, these results were, were drawn into questions. So I'm very interested to hear what you all think about whether cardiac reno actually occurs um, based upon the, these five or six studies that I'm going to show you. Um, there's one paper that, that I think convincing, pretty convincingly shows that cardiac reno, if it does exist, um, may impact left ventricular function. So I'll present that paper in more detail. And then we'll get to the um, PET CT and secondary reno phenomena patients that Attila's Attila Fair has been really working hard on and has done some really elegant work. So these are the papers um, beginning in 1986. So that was a, a busy year for um, cardiac reno. But you know, the data, there's these are small patient populations. I have no idea about the validity of these different uh, techniques. So I would rely on you to, to advise me as to whether we should um, rely, rely on the data here. Um, but they you know, they at least all of these papers concluded that they did think that when patients were having uh, Reno in the fingertips, that there was some evidence for, for abnormalities occurring in the myocardium as well. And then here's the remainder of the paper. So we'll, I'll present the Mizuno paper in, in greater detail. Um, so without belaboring this point, I, I'm interested to, to hear what you all think at the conclusion about these data. So this is the Mizuno paper. Um, I chose it because it had the highest number of patients. They included healthy controls. It was a prospective longitudinal study. Again, their objective was to investigate um, cardiac reno in patients with SSC and its impact on left ventricular function longitudinally. Um, so these patients underwent myocardial contrast echo, which apparently gives you an estimate of myocardial blood flow. And they examined patients after four minutes of a cold challenge. So they took cold packs and they placed the cold packs on the patient's chest and their groin for four minutes to induce a reno um, attack. And then they did this myocardial contrast echocardiography. They followed the patients for seven years um, and they defined the development of left ventricular dysfunction as an EF less than 50%. Um, LV evidence for LV remodeling was an increase in left ventricular volume by 20%. They defined cardiac reno as a myocardial blood flow less than two uh, standard deviations away from the mean and the healthy controls. Severe was defined as less than four standard deviations away from the healthy control mean. And they used multivariate analyses to identify the potential risk factors for uh, cardiac reno. So here were the results. They had 15 patients that had evidence of baseline cardiac reno, um, and uh, they had reduced left ventricular ejection fraction and, and left ventricular end diastolic volume or volume index um, lower at follow up compared to those who lacked cardiac reno at baseline. So they concluded that cardiac reno may be a risk factor for left ventricular dysfunction development in SSC patients. But I understand one of the limitations may be that myocardial contrast imaging um, may not be very reliable. Its, it's reliability has been drawn into question, and it's uh, only a surrogate for myocardial blood flow. It's not an act actual measurement. So here you can see the data. Um, this was the left ventricular ejection fraction and LVDVI. 
um, here's the patients that had the cardiac reno at baseline versus without. And you can see um, the differences at the seven year follow-up duration that were statistically significant. So this was the, Im what, the image that was included. And I, from a novice perspective, I guess I, I, can, I can see why this technique may not be considered very reliable. Um, this was the acoustic intensity to, to pulsing interval plot that they provided in the study. And they show the difference between a healthy, a representative healthy control and an SSC patient. But I, I don't understand the, how, they, how they go from this image to having a um, quantitative assessment of, um, of function. But um, I look forward to, to learning about that from all of you. So because um, the techniques listed in those prior papers really relied on just estimates of myocardial blood flow, I was very excited when I came to Yale to learn about um, Rubidium PET-CT, which we did not have at Northwestern, so I, we, we didn't have the capacity to do that. But this is a paper that Attila Fair and um, Al Sinousis published in 2017, where they looked at, they showed the microcirculation of a, of a pig, and so we're, we're really honing in on the, um, the microcirculation here, um, which is indicated here um, that there's these capillary bundles that really provide the nourishment to the myocardium. So that's what we're, we're interested in. So this I will ask um, uh, Ed to jump in if he so, if he deems fit, but this was a, um, a, a plot that was um, generated by Steph Thorne. And so you can see this green, this green bubble um, floating across the screen. And, and this is for the rheumatologists that are listening. Um, so the red you can see is the, is the signal that's emitted by the rubidium. And you can see that there, here's the um, signals in the right atrium and the right ventricle. And then you can see the signal tra is transmitted to the left ventricle as the blood flows into the left ventricle. And then ultimately, um, you can measure the uh, blood flow to the myocardium and you can model that and that's beyond my level of expertise but if, if Ed would like to jump in and say a word. Well, it's, it's a good description and Steph can jump in as well as so she's on but just yeah. the yeah. basics of it is to mm -hmm. model myocardial blood flow. Um, so that's the um, novice view of, of what they're doing but um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a beautiful way to be able to actually measure blood flow um, in milliliters per minute per gram of myocardium. So this is work that Attila did. Um, so he retrospectively um, evaluated the electronic health records of 51 patients. So 11 patients had primary reno. Again, those are patients that don't develop any of the nail fold capillary changes. They don't develop the digital ulcers. You know, it's just a benign, basically a vasculopathy, but it doesn't result in any long-term um, sequelae. And you can compare that to patients with secondary reno phenomena, which is associated with an autoimmune disease. So here there were 18 patients with SSC, 20 with other autoimmune diseases, such as lupus, RA, and Sjogren's syndrome. And so this was a retrospective study again, and they went and they pulled the uh, PET-CT data and um, a myocardial flow reserve less than two is considered abnormal. And so here was a representative image uh, from a patient with SSC and you can see all of the values are below two and they perform a stress images and rest images and then it's the ratio of those two images or those two tests so that's why there's no units for the myocardial flow reserve and you can see if you compare that to the healthy control all the values are above two so this was um clear clear evidence that there are abnormalities in in at least one patient with ssc so attila next looked at the association between the myocardial flow reserve and the time since the reno a phenomena diagnosis, and there was a weak but significant association. Um, and next, he looked at the differences between the groups. So here were the healthy controls, the patients with primary Raynaud, um, Raynaud phenomena with the other autoimmune diseases such as lupus and rheumatoid arthritis. And really the only thing that stood out was that the patients with SSC had a statistically significant difference between uh, their myocardial flow reserve uh, as compared to healthy controls. And this paper is under review. So again, it was just the SSC patients, but um, Attila looked at lots of different covariates um, 
and they didn't seem to really impact the myocardial flow reserve uh, very much. So again, this is under review, but um, we, we acknowledge fully that this is a single center study. This is a retrospective study. We have a small sample size. There's you know, many different confounders that we're not adjusting for, but the ones that we did look at didn't seem like they, um, that they changed the result. So the ongoing work is to determine the association between impaired myocardial flow reserve and adverse outcomes in autoimmune rheumatic disease patients, and that's uh, ongoing work. And then uh, we are going to, we plan to perform, and we are performing prospective studies in SSC patients um, with the help of uh, Drs. Miller and Ferrer and Furman. So um, this is more my uh, wheelhouse, the Raynaud phenomena and the methods to quantify Raynaud disease burdens. This is something that plagues, plagues us in clinical trials for Raynaud phenomena, which are uniformly negative, unfortunately. Because I think we're using this Raynaud condition score as the primary outcome, which is really just asking the patient to rate how severe the Raynaud phenomena is today. And then we ask them to keep a diary, a two week diary, and rate how severe their Raynaud is each day for two weeks. And the problem with this outcome is that patients may report that their Raynaud is not bothering them at all. So they'll report no difficulty. But then when you probe them, they'll say, Well, I didn't go outside and I set you know, under a bare skin rug because it was so cold outside. So they're clearly not living their lives normally and that's, that's um, obviously not a good outcome. So we've developed other outcomes. Um, we've tried, um, you know, patient assessment of Raynaud phenomena. Um, we've tried having the physician weigh in, measuring the attacks, the symptoms of the attack or the duration of the attack or the average numbers of attacks. And, and none of these are very robust and reliable. So these are newer techniques um, that have attempted to measure the uh, blood flow. Most of them are proxies for blood flow. So Dr. Berg has done a lot of work in um, patients uh, with heart disease using Endopat. And so we've elicited his expertise to help us in this next project. So we plan to do Endopat um, exams in patients who are coming in for a PET CT and we're setting up the, the mechanism whereby patients could undergo um, PET, PET CT followed by um, Endopat and also laser speckle contrast imaging with the help of uh, Dr. Sumpio in um, cardiovascular surgery. So the patients will come in and get all three of these tests at the same time. So this is um, some work that Dr. Sumpio has um, been involved with and Dr. Uh, Papa Demetrius and, and Sinusis as well. Um, but I think this, this kind of gives the idea of what we're thinking with PET-CT. So you can see here, these were patients um, who had peripheral vascular disease. And this is the bottom of the foot and the back of the ankle before uh, and after a vasc revascularization procedure, a surgical revascular procedure. Um, and this is a patient, so you can see after revascularization, you know, they, they did improve, but not nearly to the extent that this patient uh, improved. Um, and so they followed these patients out, uh, I think, three months and showed that the low perfusion responders um, had a higher uh, rate of needing an amputation at follow-up compared to the high responders. And so this shows that imaging can be a biomarker for outcomes. So that's kind of the concept that we're working from. So we have, we have had two patients. This is uh, one patient that we examined and you can see the patient had severe renal phenomena with several fingers completely missing. And this patient was referred for a PET CT. And this was the first time we tried to um, image the hand and the heart simultaneously. So the idea is we know that uh, PET-CT is great uh, at, at providing a true measurement of myocardial blood flow in the myocardium, um, but we're not so sure about the hands. And so we had this patient, you can see their arm, this is a CT scout image, you can see the hand, the arm bones uh, laid across the chest above the heart. And here, Steph Thorne um, provided these images. So you see the axial fused images of the um, arm muscles or hand muscles. Here's the sagittal fused image. And then here's another axial fused image where you can see the normal myocardial blood flow in this patient. 
So this was just a proof of concept that we can at least see, <laughs> um, see some blood flow in the muscle and, um, and, and the, the fingers. And so much work obviously needs to be done to take this into the fingers and to quantify the actual blood flow in the fingers. But again, this was just a proof of concept um, analysis. So the future work for this project is to develop this unified protocol to do all three of those imaging analyses that I mentioned. Um, we're gonna work with Dr. Papa Dimitris to develop three mold, 3D molds to ensure the hands are placed identically to the baseline exam. We plan to perform baseline and one week post baseline exams to ensure reproducibility of the technique. And then we ultimately want to develop a risk prediction model for SSC cardiac microvascular disease in order to identify patients early and try to change the course um, of their disease. And then we'd like to be able to identify and validate uh, finger and hand imaging biomarkers to predict which patients with SSC are going to develop those dreadful ulcers that I showed you a picture of or digital loss as, as I just showed you an image of. So we'd like to be able to identify those patients that are at high risk. And, and, the, and then in those patients, we can really give them aggressive um, therapy for renal phenomena. So in the last um, five minutes, um, I'll show you some data that we generated um, using T1 mapping. And these were early systemic sclerosis patients. So these were patients that had disease for less than a year. Um, so just some background, myocardial fibrosis has been observed in 50% of patients at autopsy. The gold standard uh, way to diagnose myocardial fibrosis is an endomyocardial biopsy, but that's invasive and prone to sampling error. Patients are reluctant, reluctant to undergo it for obvious reasons. Um, a standard uh, late gadolinium enhancement uh, cardiac MRI relies on normal myocardial reference area. I'm preaching to the choir, but the, these are there are rheumatologists listening too. But you have to have a normal area um, to compare to in order to identify abnormal abnormalities in the late gadolinium enhancement. So that may not be the case in a patient with systemic sclerosis who has diffuse myocardial fibrosis. There may be no normal area, so you could completely miss the myocardial fibrosis. So with that background, that, that was the impetus for the development of these newer T1 mapping methods that can detect myocardial fibrosis. So those are pre-T1 prolongation, post-T1 shortening, increased myocardial gadolinium partition coefficient, and increased extracellular volume fraction. So T1, I, I did not know this until I started working with Dan Lee, but so T1 is the time for the protons in a voxel to return to their ground state. So you pass the, the magnetic resonance field through the heart and all the protons line up, and then they kind of shimmy back into their ground state. And the time it takes them from the time they line up to the time they go back to their ground state is called T1. And gadolinium contrast agents shorten T1. So you can measure, you can get a, a, a measurement of the concentration of gadolinium by assessing the changes in T1. Oh, so here's an image with patient with late gadolinium enhancement that um, involves 16% of their left ventricle. So here were the result. Uh, this was the objective was to evaluate the utility of cardiac MRI T1 mapping in early systemic sclerosis patients. So these were 24 consecutive symptomatic patients that I saw in clinic didn't have a reason for why they were having symptoms, dyspnea or other. So referred them to uh, Dr. Dr. Shaw and Dr. Lee, and they ultimately underwent a cardiac MRI. Um, they also had 12 healthy controls who had undergone cardiac MRI, and those were the um, segments of the test. Um, there were two independent assessors who were measuring all these variables, um, and they used a C statistic to assess the diagnostic performance, predicting whether a patient was a healthy control or an SSC patient, and then they generated extracellular volume maps in a subset of patients. So there were 13 patients with diffuse disease, 11 with limited disease. So that's kind of interesting because I had told you um, that it, it's really the diffuse patients that develop the myocardial involvement. But again, is that, is that actually true? Or is that, is that really just because we haven't been able to assess adequately the myocardial involvement um, that may be occurring in patients that we just haven't, that we've been blind to all these years. So the mean disease duration was 11 months. Um, again, very early disease cohort, which is interesting too. 
um, because I previously told you that myocardial involvement happens later in the disease course. Um, there was late gadolinium enhancement in eight of the 24 patients, so 33%, and in none of the healthy controls. Um, we found that ECV, pre-T1, and lambda significantly, which is the partition coefficient for gadolinium, significantly dis differed between SSC and healthy control. And you can see that here. So here was the extracellular volume um, that was higher in the SSC patients that was significant. The partition coefficient, partition coefficient was higher in the SSC patients, as was the pre-T1. Um, Post-T1 was not significantly different between healthy controls and um, SSC patients. So we determined that ECV had the best test characteristics. Um, it had the best sensitivity, 75%, uh, both sensitivity and specificity for, a set, for determining whether a patient was an SSC patient or a healthy control. So here was um, the extracellular volume maps that were generated for um, just a subset of patients. But really, the, the panel that you want to pay most attention to is panel B. So here, the extracellular volume map um, doesn't show any myocardial fibrosis, and either does the late gadolinium enhancement images. Um, here in panel B, the late gadolinium enhancement images appear normal, but the ECV is abnormal. So this is an instance where if you just did um, late GAD enhancement and you didn't do the ECV mapping, you'd miss this patient with um, myocardial fibrosis. And here is a, an instance where the two are um, concordant. So th this is concordant finding, this is concordant finding, but this is, this is the group of patients that we're missing unless we do the T1 mapping. So I'd like to develop a specific cardiac MRI protocol for SSC patients. This may already exist. I don't know what the cardiac MRI protocol is like. At Yale, this is completely my own fault. I had reached out to Dr. Baldassar when I uh, arrived at Yale and I missed our meeting and I um, just haven't gone back to reschedule. So um, it's just been something that I've been wanting to do, but just I haven't had the bandwidth to explore, but I, I really do wanna get that up and running um, and be able to be performing T1 mapping for all SSC patients, which again may be happening and I'm just um, ignorant of that fact. So in summary, echo phenomapping may be a useful strategy for identifying clinically relevant groups of patients. Um, admittedly, we need to, to make sure that the clustering is robust and experiment with different clustering algorithms and adding in variables and making sure that our, our results are robust. Um, PET-CT may be useful for, it's definitely useful for heart uh, microvascular quantification, but it, can you do the heart and hand at the same time in one test? And that's something that we don't know. Um, and then we, I believe, at least from my limited uh, knowledge on the matter, that ECV quantification appears to be the best T1 mapping parameter for assessment of myocardial fibrosis in our patients. Um, but clearly, we need to do larger validation studies. We only had 24 patients in that initial uh, study that we published. And this is a patient with mine, of mine um, from Northwestern, and she does a lot of patient advocacy. So she's and in, in, in evidence that you can thrive with scleroderma. With that, we have our scleroderma program uh, members that I'd like to thank um, and my funding agencies, um, the research colleagues at Yale, uh, who've just been you know, wonderful, Matt Berg, um, Attila, Margaret, and, and Ed, and Xenius, and Al, and Steph Thorne, um, providing me data for for research grants and papers. My Northwestern collaborators, um, Dr. Sanjeev Shah especially, has been a really good near peer mentor to me. And then Rahul Deo uh, helped us with a lot of the modeling for the echo phenomapping study. And I'm a member of CITRA, so I just wanted to give a shout out to CITRA, which is a, a, a new group that, we're, that Perry Wilson and I started. Um, and we're really trying to, to accelerate clinical research by making um, research uh, helpers available to everybody in Department of Medicine. So um, database managers, biostatisticians, bioinformaticists, um, that's the idea. And with that, I'll take any questions. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Monique, for a wonderful and insightful uh, talk today about scleroderma and the heart. Um, as mentioned, does anyone have any questions or you 
place some questions in the chat if you do. Um, Margaret, we have uh, uh, Dr. Bender who wants to ask a question. So I'll just, uh, Dr. Bender, I think you're on mute. Uh, I am. Uh, Monique, that was terrific. And it's um, wonderful to have your expertise here, here at Yale. Um, as uh, with a, a little bit of an endothelial centric view of the world, the one term I didn't hear you use was endothelial dysfunction. You talked about cardiac Raynaud, you talked about microvascular disease, you talked about myocardial blood flow, but um, as you know better than I do, in RA and lupus patients who actually have coronary disease in addition to, to um, uh, microvascular disease, there are these interesting studies of flow-mediated dilation, FMD, where um, anti-TNF biologics not only improve their rheumatic disease, but improve pretty dramatically their FMD abnormalities. And there's thought to be an association between endothelial dysfunction and their rheumatic disease. So it's a long-winded long question, but I wonder if you could relate that to systemic sclerosis patients and talk about, I did see endopat, and that's a, <laughs> that's a, that's a reasonable test. But if you could talk a little bit about uh, endothelial dysfunction, the presence or absence of coronary disease, as in RA and, and lupus, um, in, in many of these younger patients, and, and just that whole spectrum, if you can comment on that. I, 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 I'll try to. So I, I apologize. I mean, I, I would say that I believe um, that endothelial dysfunction is the, is the precipitating event of systemic sclerosis that happens, that that is the initiating event that happens before any of this. Um, our understanding of how that occurs is very poor. Um, I believe there was one study that used an antibody against um, anti-endothelial, or they, you know, it detected anti-endothelial antibodies, and they said, see, uh, there's anti-endothelial antibodies in patients with SSC, and therefore that causes the disease. But um, my understanding from that paper was that, that the methodology was, was very questionable. So um, that there may not have, it could have been, you know, cross-reactivity between those, between the method to detect the anti-endothelial antibodies and um, many other different proteins. So I think we don't really have good, I, good data for that. But I do, I mean, I, I think the fact that patients develop Raynaud phenomena sometimes a decade before the second symptom of systemic sclerosis really underscores the fact that endothelial dysfunction is, is definitely playing a role. And I, I did show the the capillary nail folds. I mean, you, you can clearly see that there's, you know, trouble in the microvasculature in the hands that's not seen in patients. Um, there, the data for whether or not there's increased cardiovascular disease in SSC patients, I think is less robust than it is in lupus and rheumatoid arthritis. Um, but there have been several reports that patients uh, with all the autoimmune rheumatic diseases, um, ankylosing spondylitis, psoriatic arthritis, SSC, all have an increased risk of cardiovascular disease um, compared to their, you know, non-ARD controls. Um, so I think that that's a, you know, a very important um, area of research that needs to be pursued. I just don't know whether I'll be the person to pursue it, <laughs> um, but um, I, I definitely think that endothelial dysfunction is a major player in this disease. Thank you. I believe Eric has a question. Uh, yeah, hey, thank you, Margaret. Um, Monique, wonderful talk. I learned so much and appreciate uh, all the collaboration and the work you're doing. So my question relates, um, uh, I, I'm kind of a, uh, I'm trying to pull things together, um, but I've been monitoring Sanjeev's work for a long time and you know obviously one of the exciting components of the phenomapping processes that he's put in place um, for echocardiography is that maybe it provides us an insight into mechanisms that we haven't explored fully that would lead to therapeutics but frankly it's been more of a descriptor than anything at this point. You have now in your cohorts um, 
kind of a, a window into microvascular disease and it's a little follow-up to, to Jeff's question. And a question I have for you is, have you started to think about if the, the phenomapping processes that you put in place for echocardiography and systemic sclerosis can be linked in some way to, um, to your findings with Rubidium PET and, and whether, you know, perhaps uh, um, some of these groups that have been identified as descriptively with, with the eco, uh, eco phenomapping project mm -hmm. may in fact be, you know, um, subsets of microvascular endo endothelial dysfunction uh, patients, uh, you know, in that manner. So I'm just trying to see if you can pull that together. No, absolutely. I mean, that, that's the plan. Um, you know, patients are, def patients are routinely undergoing echocardiography, so that's an easy screening test. But if we could identify the, the echocardiographic signature that's associated with um, decreased myocardial blood flow as assessed by uh, PET-CT, we'd know who, in whom to refer for PET-CT. I, I mean, I, you know, Ed, Ed says rheumatologists have to get on board. We routinely do PET CT all the time, but you know, rheumatologists are not very eager to be referring their patients for PET CT um, because of the concern for radiation exposure. And so I think it would be great uh, to your point if we could identify an echocardiographic signature using echo echocardiographic data, which is readily accessible to identify patients who we know are going to be at high risk um, for decreased myocardial blood flow only after we complete the prospective studies that we plan to do. So this is kind of a 20 year plan <laughs> in terms of, you know, we want to start doing echocardiograms and measuring the echo pheno groups and then um, concurrently doing the endopet and the laser speckle and the PET CT and really deeply phenotype these patients and, and start to be able to tease apart who are the who is the group that is at increased risk for getting myocardial involvement right now i think we say that it's the patients with diffuse disease but i don't necessarily think that we can say that um, because i think our the tools that we've used to detect myocardial involvement have been so rudimentary to this point that's my opinion i'd be interested to see what you all think as cardiologists may i have a question of course okay. Sure, uh, Monique, that was a great talk and I learned so much. This is Aria Manium, uh, one of the geneticists at Yale. So you mentioned about the familial pattern and uh, uh, one thing actually has been very uh, interesting to see if we can find is the biomarkers. And I remember that was the overlap syndrome with polymyositis initially that, uh, you know, they had two biomarkers, two proteins, I don't remember exactly the name. I think there was some combination, polymyositis, scleroderma, whatever, and then was mapped to an exosome gene. I was wondering, what's the role in your patient? Are these biomarkers also valuable in your, your, and do these overlap patients also have cardiovascular disease or they are completely, totally different ent entity? Um, no, so uh, I'm trying to remember all of your questions. Margaret, you can help me. So um, we definitely use um, biomarkers uh, in our patients and the best established biomarkers I would say at this juncture are the serum autoantibodies. So I think you might be referring to the um, at PMSCL uh, protein yes, yes, that yes. detected. And that for sure is a biomarker. I mean, when we see that in patients, we're really on the lookout for, um, for polymyositis. And it, it, there's a high correlation between having that antibody and developing polymyositis, including cardiac involvement. Um, so those are the biomarkers um, that have been, you know, most validated and, and most studied. There are many others that are um, that have been identified in small cohorts but haven't been able to be validated, um, including um, biomarkers for endothelial receptors and endothelial right, right. receptor antagonists. And so there, there's a whole body of work that's looked at that. Um, but we just wrote a review article on that, and and there nothing's robustly validated. Um, I don't, what was your other question? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I was actually, so it was mapped to actually one of them to a, a exosome. I don't know what the role of that exosome is in the pathogenesis or is a different entity. Because yeah, I, I think one of these markers is actually a kind of a encoding an exosome protein. Uh, but yeah. regardless, my, my comment is also, if you have any familial pattern, I would be more than happy to kind of collaborate with you if you have it among your patients because we could actually pursue identification of novel biomarkers, right? 
Yeah, I mean, that would be thrilling. I don't currently, that I, at least not of whom I'm aware in, in our small cohort um, at Northwestern, where we followed more than a thousand patients, we definitely had patients. I definitely had patients where I was taking care of the mother and the daughter, and, or the mother and the son, and they both had scleroderma. Um, and we do have DNA uh, that, has, that has been collected and is stored at Northwestern. So we could, we could definitely look at some of those uh, familial um, groups if you're interested. Sure, thank you. Do we have any other questions from anyone? One more, a clinical question. Kasten here, can you hear me? Yes, yep. yes, I can hear you. So the question is, once you diagnose Raynaud, you said there is a, a sometimes a lag 10 to 20 years um, in terms of uh, you know, full-blown scleroderma clinically. How about the biomarkers? So once you diagnose Raynaud, do you have positive biomarkers or not? Um, I would say the biomarker, the best one is the antinuclear antibody. So if a patient has Raynaud phenomena, and we do the a visual biomarker with the nail fold capillaroscopy. Um, if their nail fold capillaries are completely normal and their ANA is negative, I'd say, I'd, I reassure that patient, say you've got primary reno and you're not gonna develop uh, an autoimmune disease. Okay. Um, for, for patients that, um, when you, you examine their nail fold capillaroscopy, and you can do it with a handheld ophthalmoscope if you put some KY jelly or some kind of um, you know, oil around the nail fold. Um, so you can do it in clinic, anybody can do it. Um, but if they, if they have normal, if they have any abnormalities on their nail fold capillary and or a positive ANA, then I would have those, I would see those patients in follow up. Maybe just once a year, we give them, I usually give them a list of the, the symptoms to be on the lookout for. And certainly if they develop any signs of digital ulcerations or digital pitting, so digital pittings where you, it looks like you took a, an ice pick and like daggered the patient's fingertips. Um, if they develop anything, you know, I just tell them if you, if your fingers look at all abnormal to you at any point, the, the, the pad of the finger, um, just come back <laughs> and, uh -huh. you know, we want to, we want to see you again and, and just run the review of systems. Um, so those are really the, the two best biomarkers, the ANA and the nail fold capillaroscopy at this juncture. But the, but the, uh, biomarkers cannot become positive later on, meaning can you have negative initially and then later on become positive? Sure, you can. Um, and so, so I, I think, um, we, you know, even the, the primary folks will, I'll, I will review the review of systems with them for systemic sclerosis or, you know, uh, lupus or, or, um, rheumatoid arthritis and, and tell them if you start to develop any any of these symptoms, you know, come back and let us take a look at you because you certainly uh -huh. can develop. Uh, you can switch to having a positive ANA over time for sure. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Excellent. I think I just want to put in a little plug. If any of you guys do have any patients with connective tissue disorders and especially scleroderma, and you are referring them for PET CC stress please let me know because we are putting them in a folder as Attila is doing research, looking at the results. So um, again, I know sometimes it could be hard to get approval um, for these studies from the insurance companies. I will say documenting obesity and if they're women, especially if they have large breasts is one way that can help with approval. Uh, yeah, that's a great point, Margaret. We are, um, Attila is very adept at search using, performing JDOT searches to identify these patients that have undergone PET-CT, but certainly prospectively collecting them is, is, always, is always best. So if, if you can, if you're referring to a patient, if you can just shoot one of us their name um, for Attila, that would be great. If there's, we have IRB approval to do that, I should say as well. <laughs> So you're not breaking any uh, rules by, by sharing that information with us. Thank you, Monique. Again, thank you for a wonderful talk. I think we've run out of time, um, but Monique's available if you have further questions or have an idea to collaborate with her. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for listening.